This is a production of Cornell University. But first of all, it's definitely a pleasure for me to be here at Cornell. In fact, I have to say Cornell has been on my bucket list for years because I used to read some stuff from Dr. David Pimentel. And so that's what really started me to be connected. But uh, as Matthew said, I started farming in 1972. I was going to go to the university and get a master's degree in guidance counseling. Instead, I went and bought an 80-acre farm and haven't looked back and haven't regretted it. And in 1975 is when I first did certified organic. And we were writing the rules uh, starting then. Okay, and as, as, you know, as it says here, uh, I never intended for it to be this way. I've only wanted to do for myself what I hope others would do for themselves. To generate pleasure, happiness, and self-fulfillment from being a farmer. And over the years, I started seeing things like this. That's farmland in central Minnesota in April, getting ready for corn planting. And that's not a desert, that's farmland. Those aren't sand dunes, that's field. And we know what bare land can do when you have precipitation and the flashing of the soil. You know, protection of the elements and uh, soil. And I'm, I'm talking to some people uh, earlier this morning, I am excited about what I'm seeing as the emphasis on soil health, water quality, and of course, in my case, organic farming. The, the stories I'm picking up here on campus are exciting to me. And so uh, it's really a pleasure for me to do that. Here again, just looking at some of the uh, issues. That's a drainage ditch and that's snow that's drifted in and that's there's snow under that black drip. And so we know that our issues are something that need to be done. Again, we can see how we have really not taken care of our soils. And these are the things that I was picking up over the years, even as I was moving in, or, in organics. And so, that's what prompted me to really start looking at the soil. And what you see there is <coughs> the farm uh, where we live. And about six or seven years ago, I uh, decided that I was going to really reduce the tillage on that farm. And so it, when we harvest the corn and when we harvest the soybeans, we leave the field till the next spring. And that to me was a major change in our operation because up to that point, it was always get out there, get the crop harvested in the fall and get the tillage done and then leave it. But what we did in fact is change that. We decided we don't need to do that fall tillage. And the, the way I learned that is that I've got a, a son and daughter-in-law who live in Cincinnati. And so every Thanksgiving, we drive from Minnesota to Cincinnati. We drive to Iowa and Illinois and Ohio and Indiana. And we would see all these fields that were harvested, but nothing else was done to them. And I got to thinking, if these farmers can do no fall tillage with their big uh, 1,000 bushel, 1,200 bushel grain carts and heavy equipment over those fields and not be impacted by soil compaction, I should be able to do something like that in organic. My challenge would be the weed management, but I should be able to do something like that. And so I got home and I, I, I started talking to a few people and, and that's what we did. We eliminated the fall tilling. And uh, it's made all the difference. We can see that. But the reason I've got these quotes up here is because I think this is what's really driving us today and we don't even realize it. You know, the idea of local economy by uh, Wendell Berry. 
we will be wrong if we attempt to correct what we perceive as environmental problems without correcting the economic oversimplification that caused it. Corn, and I'm talking about the Midwest, corn, soybeans, corn, soybeans, corn, soybeans, and in, in, in the economic system. And what we're all engaging in, because as you said, this oversimplification is now either a matter of corporate behavior or behavior under the influence of corporate behavior. This is sufficiently clear to many of us, but here's the piece where we come in. What is not sufficiently clear, perhaps, to any of us is the extent of our complicity, how we carry it on ourselves by what we do day to day. And so that's as individuals and especially as individual consumers, how do we promote what's going on? That, that's a hard question to really face, but we have to face it. And then we look at that and how, it's, how it applies to the economy. We are drifting into what amounts to a reversion, a throwback to the feudalistic system from our European ancestors that had escaped from there. If we look out in Midwest Minnesota, we've got mega dairy operations, eight, 9,000 cows under one roof. We've got hog operations that are industrialized, 1,000 head of hogs, we've got six or eight or 10 barns with hogs in them. And this is what we're really talking about here. Except for the core of managers, the corporate structure will be dwarfing to the human spirit if we're just looking at production in an industrial manner. In much of agriculture, the man or woman on the land will not be an imaginative innovator, but a faithful follower of written instruction. Because if, if I'm trying to manage 10,000 dairy cows, all I can do is follow the rules that the boss said. I can't be creative. The opportunity isn't there. And so that's where uh, the, being an organic farmer has always been so fulfilling because I can be creative. I can be creative to the degree that I choose. And the other thing is, and the question is, why do we have, why don't we have a lot of sustainable agriculture? Dr. Richard Levin is a good friend of mine, a retired ag economist, and he really pointed it out to me here. He says, I think we would be closer to answering this question if we face the fact that farmers no longer sit in the driver's seat. If I call myself a farmer and I'm trying to operate 10,000 cows, I'm not in charge. Somebody else is in charge. So we are entirely too quick to say, for example, that we have problems with farm chemicals because farmers use them. We don't say it's because farm chemical companies develop, manufacture, and promote them. There's a reason why they're promoting. It. So clearly, farmers are not the decision makers in poultry production and much of hog production due to contracting. And we see this in dairy as well. We are no longer in charge when we look at how industrial agriculture has moved. My concern is that we might be looking at that in organic production as well into the future. But let's Let's look at what I've been able to achieve and what I see a lot of my organic farmers being able to achieve over the years. And obviously this is a cartoon, but it really, really says a lot of what, what is going on out there, how we've let uh, uh, corporations and uh, large industry really take over our food system. But for me, it all started back in the 1950s when I was a child growing up on the farm there was a magazine laying on the kitchen table that was called Organic Gardening and Farming. And I would listen to my dad and my uncles talk, talk about organic gardening and farming and not realizing that all that conversation was being stored in the back of my head here. And so it started coming out in 1961, as this picture shows, where I was a freshman in college, but my dad was already innovating new practices on the farm. Back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, the moldboard plow was the way to do the tillage. But a, a neighbor, or a, a, an implement dealer in town came out one day and said, I've got this chisel plow that uh, you should cross. And so that's a picture of the chisel plow that my dad started using actually back in the 1940s and 50s. 
but it created in me an idea of being creative, being innovative, trying new things. And uh, I, that really uh, stuck with me. I had opportunity after opportunity to be interviewed by people, um, video things about what was going on in the farm. And a, a, a professor at the University of Minnesota told me once, if you wanna really learn what you're doing, start preaching it or not preaching it, but start talking about it and start trying to educate other people about it. And then you will begin to find out how much you actually learn. So when I'm getting interviewed by people, I better know what I'm talking about. And if I don't, uh, I'm gonna not look too sharp. Um, the farm has always been uh, trying things. And I should back up a little bit. Give a little background on the farm. We have about 400 acres and a young family is now taking over the operation and together with what he has and what I have, we have about 1200 acres, about 900 acres tillable and about uh, 300 uh, in uh, 200 in grazing pasture, wetland and short prairies, things of that sort. But that's the operation. And uh, um, in the 1980s, we were going to have an organic certification meeting on the farm. And an hour before that meeting started, we had all the certifiers on the farm. County weed inspectors drove up and said, we better do something about those Canada thistle in that field. And so that was to me, you know, it was a wake up call, but it was also uh, a teachable moment. I said, if I'm going to be successful in organics, I better learn how to manage weeds, not control them, but manage them, manage them to a level that I can be profitable at. And that, that's what started me really thinking along those lines. I tried to do organic from the very first, but it was, and it still continues today to be just uh, a work in progress, to say the least. Uh, and I've been uh, recognized with various things. I did have the privilege of serving in the endowed chair in sustainable systems at the University of Minnesota in 1997. Again, an opportunity for a farmer to be directly engaged in the work that takes place in the university and try to bring some of that information, some of that research, some of that work out to the people. And so that was a tremendous opportunity for me. So what are the principles that I've learned over the years as far as organic? I'm gonna go through these quickly, but these are basically what they are. Commitment to organic must be philosophical, social, and economic in that order. It's got to happen up here before you're going to be successful on the land. And that doesn't happen to a lot of people. And so that is so critical. Organic production with a conventional attitude will not work. I can tell you any number of farmers here, I'm going to go in there because I can get eight, nine, ten dollar corn year in and year out. It will not be successful, I can guarantee you. <laughs> Excuse me, the 10% rule on 100% commitment. People said, how, so how should I transition? I always tell them, if you really want to do it, you take 10% of your acreage, provided you don't farm half the time, right? take 10% of your acreage and commit it to organic for three years. Regardless of how successful or unsuccessful you are, make that commitment and you will know whether you can do it then or not. So that was the other thing. Acceptable weed management. Acceptable weed management will always be a big challenge. What is acceptable? And it's not acceptable based on what your neighbor said. It's acceptable about what your bottom line is. And that will be probably one of the biggest challenges. Adequate soil fertility levels will be challenging, but doable. We can't just go to a local fertilizer store and buy fertilizer. We've got to figure out how to maintain soil fertility in different ways rotations, whatever, we'll, we'll get into that. You have to think and act positive. I can be uh, about this time of year, I'm not sure I'm doing the right thing on the farm. I see all these things that didn't work out. And so we get crop harvested and the snow starts flying and I sit around the house and I say, yeah, I think I can make this work in about the middle of January. I said, yeah, I'm ready to get out there again. I know I've got all these issues solved. And so we get out there, start planting in the spring, get the crops in, 
and then it started cultivating a rotary horn. And I started seeing weeds. I mean, weather isn't raining great where I, and whatever, and everything about again, middle of July or August, then why am I doing this? Why don't I just call the local fertilizer store or the chemical store and go out there and spray that North 40? I can sleep at night. And it happens every year. The cycle goes over and over and over. And so you've got to think positive and you've got to uh, act positive. Um, be oblivious to peer pressure. And I would say less time in the coffee shop, more time driving around those fields with the four wheeler and looking at what's going on there. Perseverance and patience are required character attributes. You, you cannot give up. Absolutely. You've got to persevere. I can tell you over and over when I've had issues with a field and I mowed off a field. I've worked under a field because it got away from me. It's the tuition. That's, that's tuition. We'll talk a little bit about that. Perseverance and so Self-reliance and creative mind are prerequisites. You really think these things through. And how do I do that? And I'll show you something a little bit later, but keep that one in mind. Higher price is no substitute for lower yields. If you can't get your farm to be competitive with all of your neighbor's yields, you still have work to do. And it can be done but you still have work to do. And we're, we've proven that over the years that it can be done. <clears throat> marketing, always think twice about marketing. You might be able to market your crops at a good price, but are you keeping in mind how are you gonna help some of your fellow organic farmers protect that price by making sure that all of you can get that good price instead of just looking after yourself? So that's what we really mean by uh, not going alone in marketing. And seek out reliable sources to educate yourself. When I started, we were writing the rules of organic. In fact, I helped write some of the original rules that went, went into the organic standard. We were writing those in the 1980s and defining them. We were talking to people like Rodale, but we were writing the rules. But today, you can go on the internet for hours and hours and hours and find all the information you want on organic for sure. Don't become an evangelist. Build it and the people will come. Will come. There's no question about it. In the early years, I was in adult farm management and the adult farm management instructor would come out uh, once a month and we'd have a farm visit. And say, so <clears throat> these people in town are wondering what you're doing out here now today. And every once in a while, I have some of my friends say, yeah, we're sitting in a coffee shop the other day and the question came up, so what's the crazy farmer East of Madison doing in the farm now? Look at those weeds, look at this, look at that. Um, I don't know if you know or knew uh, the poet Robert Bly. But anyway, Robert Bly, world-renowned poet, was one of my greatest supporters. He loved what I was doing out there. I had two or three people in town that totally supported me. But the point is, I wasn't listening to anything. I was focused on that farm. Why didn't it work this year? Or why did this work? And that that's where I had to be. And that worked. Going to workshop, reading, YouTube, it's all out. If you look for it, you can find it. Expect failure. It's called tuition. And I won't want to even tell you how much tuition I paid over the years. But if you don't learn from it, it's not doing any good. But expect it, it's going to be there. And the big thing is attitude. You got to think positive. You got to think, I can do this. I got to be able to ask people about it. And so fear of weeds. When I when the person calls me and asks about organic, how do I deal with weeds? We start talking, we start figuring it. It's taken me 40 some years and I still haven't figured it out. But we're learning from year to year. We figure out, okay, this didn't work. How can we do this? I was telling somebody earlier this morning, I've been working on tweaking a cultivator, a row crop cultivator for 45 years, and we're still tweaking it. After the cultivating season is over, Luke, the young farmer is taking over. We sit and say, okay, next year we got to do this. Next year we got to do this. It's a constant work in progress. Uh, peer pressure decision. Like I said, stay away from the coffee shop. Figure out what you got to do on your farm because you're writing your paycheck. Nobody else. Keep that in mind. And finally, make a profit. No matter how much it costs, 
When I look at how people throw money looking for the magic bullet, whether it's an organic or not, that's not the approach. If everybody is doing the same thing, only one person is thinking. Okay. So that's again, you know, depend on yourself, depend on your own creative skill to do it. Um, this is a soybean farmer from the Madison area. And he had an article written and he said, like other American soybean farmers, I know we'll ultimately win. And he was talking about the resistance that weeds were gaining on some of the newest chemicals. So all I could respond was, really? <laughs> weeds, there's a reason why weeds are around. They're survivors. They always will be survivors. So we have to attitude. We got to think about it. You know, we made uh, 30000 last year, but it cost us 60000 you can't buy your production. You've got to figure out how to do it. You know, on an organic farm, reading labels and following directions is not an option. It's what you become creative with. It's what you can do with what you've got to work with, for sure. You are in charge. Absolutely. You make the decision. You certainly have help with it, but you make the decision. And I, I keep coming back to this, you know, eyes belong to the, uh, answers belong to the eyes that see them. And Wes Jackson and other people have said it, there's much more to be discovered than to be invented. I've got a four wheeler. I think that's the next, no, that's not the next one. I've got a four wheeler that I usually put on uh, four to 500 miles a summer going out and looking at the field. And I never get more than two miles from home. But I put that many miles on every summer going out there looking at what's going on in that field. And so it's things like manures and compost, robots, pit rotation, underseed, crop rotation, grant green manures. And it's always alternative input, not lower input. I buy, you know, finding a, a livestock manure uh, prior to getting a herd going on the farm, I was buying. Uh, $10,000 to $20,000 worth of livestock manure a year for fertility. That's an alternative input, it's not lower input. Rotation, buy two or $3,000 worth of cover uh, underseeding legumes, alternative input. Cultivating instead of spraying. All of those kinds of things come into it. And no farmer likes to mess up, but there's part of me looking forward to my next mistake so I can learn and get better. Absolutely. I never had this happen to me, but I think you get the message. We do make mistakes, and uh, organic has to be timely. But this is the four wheeler I'm talking about. I'll drive around all the time, checking things out, what's going on, seeing, trying to see what's going on in those fields, and see what you're seeing. Don't just look at it. See what you're seeing and, and make decisions about it, make judgments about it. And don't be afraid to change. And the other thing is, you know, uh, I should back it up a second. It's very site specific and management specific. Where you farm out here in the Finger Lakes region is totally different from out there on the plains where I always tell people it snows sideways. Okay, so we always got wind and we get the heat and it can get pretty dry and it's all corn and soybean. And I, I come out to this part of the country and it's paradise. I look at the lakes and Everything else, the roads aren't very straight, but what the heck, I still see it. And uh, so it is, you manage with what you've got, where you live, for sure. And finally, you know, again, if everybody's doing the same thing, there's only one person thinking. So uh, we always keep those things in mind. So the other two things are timeliness and patience. And timeliness, uh, 20 years ago, I had this, uh, People come back to Madison and they were going to start farming and doing uh, um, gardening farming. And I said, one of the things that you're going to find yourself doing is watching the sky because the weather, and I'll show you something shortly, the weather is going to be your great determiner. That's going to decide what you do when you do it. And so timeliness and patience come into play. 
Do I go out there and plant today? Do I go out there and rotor hoe today? Do I cultivate tomorrow? When do I plant the corn, et cetera? And we'll cover some of those things. So what are the challenges? And we can summarize them. Fertility and weather. Compaction and weather. Planting days and weather. Seed bed prep and weather. Paperwork, record keeping, inspection and certification, markets and marketing weather, rotations and weather, equipment and weather, seeding rate, quality, characteristic weather, weed seed banks and weather, mechanical weed management and weather, rotary hole, pine weeder, flame weeder, cultivators, weather. Weather determines your success. And the more you can work with it, the more successful you will be. And one thing, since I started farming in 1972 till today, the weather forecasts have improved significantly. In fact, I can have this cell phone with me and check the weather hour by hour and know, should I get on that cultivator now or should I wait? And you start learning the history of the weather, but it will determine your success. There's no question about it. And I, I picked this cartoon up uh, and it, it's been so true. There seems to be some question as to who is in charge. And I think we do know who it is. Weeds will always be the big thing. I'm not gonna go through all these, but if you look at some of the statistics here, those numbers were unbelievable. Weed management is mechanical and biological. Biological, but I mean by rotation, especially. And by using certain crops, legends, uh, cover crops, all of those things. Mechanical, because the cultivator, rotary hole, all those kinds of tools. But it is a two-pronged approach, for sure. And so here's generally the rotation that I will use. We'll have a small grain. A lot of times we used to underseed it with a legend. But now what we'll do is harvest a small grain and then do a light tillage and put in a cover crop, turnips, radishes, uh, uh, field peas, uh, sunflowers, and a couple of mixes. And then with the, with the herd that we just introduced to the farm, the beef cow herd, uh, in uh, late October, when that cover crop is standing like this, it graze and, and it, it provides feed uh, source for those cows for another month or so. But then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll have... Um, a small grain, it could be a real, uh, there could be alfalfa after it, there could be just a cover crop, corn, soybeans, and then back to it. And we're going to, what we're trying to do here is try to figure out how we can innovate and introduce turns up into this because turns a lot, operate a lot the same way as alfalfa, as a perennial. So rotations are a work in progress and we rotate the function as well as market opportunities. What is the market looking for to do? What do they want? but also how is my weed management happening? How is my fertility happening with these rotations? And uh, keeping notes, if you may not be able to read that, but that is the inside lid of the grain drill that my dad had back in the 1940s. And he would put on there the date when he started planting each year. He was collecting data back then already on how things would work. Well, and in the 1980s, I bought a $300 soil thermometer and I kept track of the soil temperatures hour, hour, over an hour and say it would, it would accumulate 35 days. And so I could start seeing the soil temperature trends. And then I started uh, also putting soil temperature trends with uh, weed seed germination and crop germination. How do they correlate? And I came to realize that soil temperatures for every 18 degrees of soil temperature rises, the micro population in the soil doubles. So the soil temperatures go up, nitrogen levels move down in the soil. I'm building my own source of nitrogen, okay? And why is that important? Because with that soil thermometer, I was able to track, and this is just one month out of the year, I was able to track the soil temperatures for one month. And the uh, red line is the soil temperature and the yellow line is the air temperature. But what I found, and I'll show you this uh, right here, May 20th 
is when the soil temperature in Minnesota started staying above 50 degrees 24 7. I looked at when does corn and when does soybean best germinate when the soil temperatures stay above 50 degrees. When did some of the weeds germinate? Some of them are going to be germinating later, some of them are going to be germinating uh, uh, before. That was some of the information I was picking up with that soil thermometer. So the conclusion was that I always get this cold snap right in the second week in May. In Minnesota, we always call it the fishing opener. And we've had snow uh, on fishing opener. So I knew that that wasn't going to happen. The thing I'm finding out, even as climate change is, is, seems to be affecting us, those dates are still holding quite true. So after the 15th or 16th of May is when I started looking at corn planting and soybean planting, because that's when I know I can get the seed in the ground and it's going to get up early and I can get ahead of it with cultivating and weed management. Learning all these learning tools, putting that stuff together, being creative, thinking about what I've got to work with, that, that's what makes it uh, so rewarding. And at this time of year, I'm really excited because things are falling together. And like I told you, from June or July or August, uh, I'm not so sure. But we keep trying each year. So, and, and then learning from people, and, and the name that comes to mind is Matt Liebman from Iowa State, who has done some terrific research on uh, some of this data. And the, the bottom one, especially, is, is something else. A single female field cricket sheltered by grassy strips can eat more than 240 weed seeds in a 24 hour period. If I'm looking at weed management, why not have the crickets and some of those people help me on it? That they're again, seeing what you're seeing, learning what you can do on your farm. And uh, I they wanna go back to, oh yeah. There's some, there's some great literature out there as well that can really help you on it. So, is growing organic field crops a viable option? You may not be able to see some of these uh, numbers, but uh, I was I, I was in adult farm business management from the first year that I farmed all the way up until I quit farming, and we would crunch numbers. And um, my <clears throat> my bottom line is that some crops were profitable, some were not. I always put alfalfa in a rotation, but if I was going to go on this chart and tell you that I made money on alfalfa, I'd probably say no. I was losing money, but I, there were non-cash benefits. I was building soil health, and I was doing a lot of good weed management tools, and those were actually becoming my herbicide. So that's what, those are what I call the non-cash benefits. Those are the things that I was starting to learn by there. And by doing that farm business management, I was able to uh, know what those numbers were. So I'm gonna fast forward to 2011. And uh, I was introduced to Kernza, a perennial wheat. And Dr. Don Weiss from the university, who I worked with together for some 30 years, uh, he said, you wanna try some, uh, oops, I didn't to get that here. It should come through here, shouldn't it? Maybe not. Okay, no problem. But uh, uh, this looked like an opportunity because it's a perennial. It comes back each year, and yet it's a crop that will produce a grain, and we should be able to harvest it. But what is the challenge? And the challenge is that growing, harvesting, and moving new grain with food grade quality into an economically viable market long term, reliable, adequate amounts becomes a challenge. A new company or a company wanting to put in a new product, are they going to be that quick to do it? So it's going to be a learning curve that's going to go a long way. So that, that's what the challenge is. This is what the current of field will look like. I should back up that. No, that's good. This is what the current of field will look like in early March, April. And it, it gets green and it will look like that as well in September and October after you've harvested it. So it comes back and perform, it creates a beautiful color. So what are the agronomic challenges? You know, should you grow organic or non-organic? 
and a rotation, where it can be fitted into your rotation. I'm not going into detail because I'll be around this afternoon if they want more detailed questions, but these are the things that we're looking at. Where do I get seed? How do I prepare the seed bed, seeding equipment? Uh, I can tell you that most of the equipment, in fact, all of the equipment that we use on our regular crop works just fine with, with curve. So it's it's definitely not an issue. But how do, how heavy to seed it? What, uh, what's the seeding date? Fertility date? How do, uh, fertility, how do you uh, put the fertility on it and when do you do it? Weed management. Is there a challenge in weed management? Because uh, two, up to two years ago, there weren't even any herbicides that could be used in a conventional system. And so weed management. Harvest time and equipment, post-harvest storage, and processing, all these things. And this is what currently will look like close up when it's pollinated. So you get an idea of that picture. And so what are the financial risks? Robust price discovery. Uh, uniform food grade, decreased yield over time, grazing and forage opportunities. All these things uh, were certainly some of the challenges that we looked at. And uh, there's no need for me to go into detail because I could spend uh, two or three hours just talking about that. This is what the seed had looked like when it's about ready to harvest, okay? And so we got the seeding rate. We're looking at about 12 to 15 pounds of, of, of uh, pure live seed per acre. Uh, harvesting it, we found that there's two different ways to harvest it. The stripper head worked the best because when the grain is ripe, when the seed head is ripe, the scent is still grass seed. And so you have to figure out all you can keep from all that grass grease that's getting into the hopper. The stripper head just takes the strip, takes the seed head up, leaves the rest of the crop standing. Uh, or we can put it in a windrow and then let it dry for a few days and harvest it that way. Or you can straight cut it. Straight cutting really is a challenge because you do get a lot of green stem into the hopper and makes it uh, a less quality product. But that's what it will look like when it's harvested and in the hopper. You can see turns it looks like a miniature wheat seed. And I say miniature because it's about the third, maybe a third the size of a kernel of wheat. But that's what it will look like. A lot of hulls on it yet, but it's there. And so uh, the big challenge was, how are we going to market it? So we can grow it. Anybody can grow it, but who's going to buy it? So we put together a co-op in Minnesota. We've got about 35 growers. And what we're trying to do is balancing the development and the production and utilization. There's one thing you can grow all this stuff, there's no market, what are you gonna do with it? And you can't just leave it sit in the bin. So, uh, you know, these are some of the things that are being used, being, what is being used for, but this is the actual picture of the currency field right before it's getting ripe. What I love about this field is that's organic and it looks like it's gonna be a really good weed management tool. That's the beauty of the field. But we're talking about the marketing. We got to meet the needs of the farmer producer and help them figure out where it's going to be marketed. And it's a new concept. It's perennializing. We planted one year and we planted in uh, late August. And then the next three years, it comes back each year without being planted and we harvest it. But there are some challenges because the yield tends to drop off. And so what, how can we figure that out? Lots of work being done on it. Uh, we figure there's about 15 to 18 years yet of work to get Kernza to be competitive with wheat yield-wise. So that tells you where we're at in the development stages. But there's some products out there now already, and people are using them. And uh, we're still working on uh, market development. We've got a great working relationship with the University of Minnesota. You know, we got the, the growers co-op is a direct connection with NRCS. We're working with them. We're working with USDA and we're working with the University of Minnesota. We, we, we have the crops out there in the field. They're doing the research in the labs. In fact, this year, we'll probably be planting about five acres of a new variety that hopefully will be the new release in 2024. A variety that will probably have doubled the seed size and increase the yield by 25%. We're talking uh, five, 600 pounds of seed production per acre on currency. And once you get it clean, 
and food grade ready, you're probably only looking at about 300 pounds of usable product per acre. So there's two, two issues there. If you're only going to have 300 pounds of grain, how are you going to make it competitive with the rest of the crop? So the co-op is working on the markets, and we figured out what that grain is worth uh, based on yield, but based on what I can get off of other crops. And so we're pricing organic uh, Kernza at five and a half to six dollars a pound, which is going to gross us in that twelve to fifteen hundred dollars an acre. Will be competitive with organic corn and organic soybeans. Those are the kinds of things that the co-op is working on. So yeah, we do have this great collaborative effort with the University of Minnesota. If I had more time, I'd tell you a funny story about them, but I don't have the time. But I would talk to other people about <clears throat> the. Uh, Forever Green Initiative. These are all of the crops that are either winter annuals or perennials that are being developed primarily at the University of Minnesota because we're looking at perennials and continuous living cover on the land as a driver for future research and crop development. And these are the things that they're working on. And Kernza happens to be the poster child at this point. It's the one that seems to be the farthest along as being a really marketable crop. And so uh, if you just go on uh, Google Forever Green Initiative, uh, uh, all the information will be out there for you. But marketing, of course, has been the biggest challenge. But here's the piece that I really want to emphasize there, and that is this. If there's no margin, there's no mission. So if I can't produce a crop and, and generate a profit, my mission is done. It's not going to happen. So in terms of marketing, Kernza must be monetized at a level reflecting these services. And these services must remain an integral part of the Kernza market price discovery. So what we're really emphasizing when we're marketing Kernza at that per acre revenue generation, that 12 to 15, 16 dollars, we're not only getting paid for the grain, we wanna get paid for the ecosystem services that that crop will provide soil health, water quality, and continued social viability to get new and younger farmers able to come on the land and continue farming. So it's the ecosystem services that we really want to drive when we're talking about these forever green crops, and in particular right now, the Kerns itself. And there again, that's what it will look like in, in the hopper. You can see some of the green stems, some of the things that are there, but that's what it is. I've done this thing quickly. We're just about out of time uh, because if I was going to do the organic thing, I've got 350 slides and I've done a lecture that's been all day. It's been four or five hours. So you can tell you, you can tell you how fast I've gone through it. But I tried to hit the high spots. And if there's time for questions, I'm open, but whatever. Yeah, absolutely. So you, we have five minutes to show for questions. Is there a question for the audience? Yeah, thank you so much, Harold. That was very illuminating. I was really getting excited when you talked about creativity. Um, but then I was sort of disappointed that you advocated against coffee shops. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and and I, because I think you are a trailblazer and you are a first doctor. So the coffee shop was probably a bad idea. But now, how, how, in an ideal world, how do you see peer-to-peer -peer learning that catalyzes the adoption of, of sustainable practices and, and, and what you're talking about? Because a lot of people could learn from you, maybe in a coffee shop, maybe somewhere else, but, but how do you see that now that there, are, that there is a critical uh, mass of, of people that, that can actually be learned from? How can we make this peer-to-peer -peer learning happen? Uh, excellent question. And I guess I've been, I haven't noticed it because uh, I'll get two, three, four calls a week on questions about currency and organic. So for me, it's been going on, but you make an excellent point. What we've done is have a field day each year and we've got uh, infrastructure out there that has field days around the country. That's only one day. I think, I think universities like Cornell could start developing some, um, how can you say it? Some uh, uh, workshops, some some 
uh, series of meetings throughout the year. What we really want to do with Kernza, in fact, is over the winter month, have a series of get togethers in, uh, in the state where people could come together and just sit and talk about these things. Uh, I think the other ideal place, we were at, uh, at Ithaca Bakery this morning. I think there should be a room in there that would provide the opportunity. Absolutely. Uh, we've got to make that happen. That's where we, you know, we've got, we got the cell phone, we got all these things, but there's nothing to substitute for eye to eye sitting in the same room talking. So we've got to make that happen. Your point well taken for sure. Yes. I once read that the separation of animal production from meat production created two problems in one solution. And I feel like you touched on that a little bit here. And I'm wondering with the current economic structure in the Midwest, whether you see those two coming together and bring the future together. So bringing together uh, the, the livestock and the field production uh, over the years. Uh, I, I don't think there's been enough research to point that out. Uh, because to me, a lot of the benefits of livestock in the system are gonna be what we'd call non-cash benefits. And the data and the research has not been able to put a value on those non-cash benefits. The same way as I was emphasizing on the ecosystem services from Kernza. In fact, we've been talking about that in our co-op meetings and, and with farmers. How do we put a value on those uh, ecosystem services? How much value is there in keeping the, the uh, nitrogen from seeping into the wellhead protection areas? How much value is there from keeping the soil in place instead of where it was on, on those pictures I showed you? That research is critical. And if there's one place that I would love to see uh, research in the uh, in ag and agricultural areas at any university is trying to define those values. Because if we put a dollar value on that, it will change the scene quickly. Absolutely, it will. Really interesting that you uh, mentioned social viability, and you know, one thing I think a lot of local communities there's uh, you know, there's aging out where you have. This brain drain of a lot of young people. How do you envision you know, getting young people staying in rural communities or coming back to you know uh, back to the Number one, policy. Okay, policy does not uh, reward farmers who want to get another farmer engaged in their operation. Policy says in order for me to be profitable, I have to get bigger and bigger and bigger. That's the number one. The other thing is, uh, when I talk about marketing and I said, don't go it alone in marketing, work with others to make sure you protect that market. That in fact was the purpose, one of the major purposes for the co-op is to protect that five and a half and $6 per pound price of that currency. I'm not gonna get it if I go to the market by myself, but if all 35 of us in that co-op go and get that six dollars what, what are we doing we're generating income not only to make the farm profitable but to support the infrastructure and the social structure of that community so it is policy but it's also a responsibility of the growers themselves over the years what i was able to do because i was in organic and i was receiving prices for organic that were above the conventional prices so when luke peterson came to me and we, over time, figured out how he could take over the farm. What I was able to do with Luke is say, yes, uh, I think you can make a, I think you can make a good living on this farm because what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a reasonable rate on cash rent, but I'm also going to let you buy my equipment over a period of time. In other words, I'm going to finance you. And it was a tax benefit for me and a way for him to get in. But because of the higher prices I've gotten for organics over the years, I was in a situation where I could do it. Uh, the other thing is, uh, so we wanted to do livestock. He wasn't in a position to buy uh, uh, to buy the, the cows. I said, look, I'll buy the cows because it's, a, again, a tax benefit for me and it's a benefit for the farm and you can keep the cats. 
and I keep the cows, and over time, uh, I'm getting tax benefit, and you're getting the cows. Those types of things. So it's it's two things. It's, it's policy, and it's the farmers planning to do uh, doing some planning to make sure that they can put a young farm on that farm with some kind of reliable way of making the profit. If you're going to buy any kind of equipment uh, on a on the acreage that Luke and I have together now, you're going to have a couple. If you're going to really have the equipment you need, you're going to be looking at at least a million dollars worth of equipment. A million dollars just for equipment. We're not even talking about uh, seed costs and input costs and all those things. So you've got, we as older farmers have got to figure out how to be able to set up and help the young ones. It, again, I come back to those two pieces. And that's what I mean when I emphasize that social piece of ecosystem services. That to me is critical. Absolutely critical, but we haven't talked about that nearly enough. And that's and I'm and uh, it may get back to the University of Minnesota, but I, I'm not, I, I don't care. The University of Minnesota has failed in rural sociology, and that's the piece that I think is always missing the rural sociology. How do you talk about the impacts of the rural if you're not going to figure out how to fix it? Are you even finding the issues that are out there? Well, let me get on my call for here. So, maybe one more question. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I have a question. Okay. So, historically, crop insurance for creative, innovative cropping systems is a challenge. Um, how are you? Are you seeing anything promising in the pipeline for supporting farmers who are taking alternative options, organic options? Um, I probably got the best crop insurance agent in the world. I mean that seriously. Because if I want a new crop in my rotation, he will figure out how we get crop insurance done. He will sit down and help do it. And so uh, it's not always easy, but I do see policy changing in the crop insurance world. I see the government being much more open to innovative crops and trying to provide some kind of safety net there. So it is moving in the, in, in the right direction. From what I've seen, and so I'm optimistic about that. A couple of years ago, I went to dry, I'd go dry field peas. My my agent worked until the middle of July to get that insurance for those peas, but it, we got. It. Uh, Luke is working on sunflowers, and and we're getting that covered. So it's part, you know, doing your own part part of it, but pushing the system as well. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.